Hello, Dr. Dave Webster, and this is part of my ongoing video blog series about the travesty of lack of access to PET CT in Ontario. And this one is the consequences of living in Ontario's so called patients first, evidence based healthcare system. And the question we're going to be contemplating is this Why is this 83 year old female with breast cancer doomed to potential unnecessary suffering simply because she lives in Ontario? Here's the bone scan of the patient. We'll do this in more detail. This is normal bone down here. This is spread of cancer to her right femur throughout the entire central skeleton here and for example in her right arm. Now this is an 83 year old female. She's had a lot of aches and pains for quite some time now. They're, it's worse for the last, last six months and she has another CT of her chest in this case in December of 2018 but it shows many findings that are concerning uh, for breast cancer as we'll see. Just to orient you here, this is the heart, this is the patient's breasts here, uh, ribs and so on. This is a right lung and left lung but what I want you to focus on is this right here. This is a very abnormal mass in the breast concerning for cancer and so she appropriately has an ultrasound guide of biopsy and unfortunately confirms that it is breast cancer. But there are many other findings as well. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, for example, her thoracic spine here and these dark white areas here. That's evidence of sclerotic or high calcium content of spread of cancer or metastasis to the bones. Uh, if we look in the lung, a different window here, we call this a lung window there's a little a nodule there. There's another one in the right lung I didn't show you. That would be concerning. Here's her liver. There's a little focus right there. Again, concerning not diagnostic, but concerning for spread of cancer here. And also, if we look again, this is her left axilla here, and these are lymph nodes. So where the CT report said, well, there are a few extra lymph nodes in the left axilla, axilla, mildly enlarged, could represent metastasis, no way of knowing. As I pointed out in my previous videos, um, a CT has no ability to differentiate whether this is active cancer or maybe it's just an old scarred lymph node from a previous infection, for example. But the FDG PET scan shows active uptake here. Now remember, this is just sugar, so that wouldn't if this was the only finding on the scan, it actually wouldn't necessarily be cancer. It could be an infection and so on. But you have to look at the whole context of the scan and the information. And it turns out there's another not so obvious mass here, pretty obvious on the PET scan. And when you see these combinations and the degree of uptake, this is virtually certainly going to be cancer. If you weren't sure, you could certainly very easily put a little needle in there and get a tissue sample because this patient clearly has widespread stage 4 breast cancer, it would now be appropriate to get a CT of the brain, which was done in January. Um, and we'll see why you would do the CT, uh, because of course you want to know if it's the cancer is there, but why would you use PET? We'll, we'll see why in a moment. But this is a, um, a cartoon of the brain, the front of the brain, the frontal lobes, the back with the occipital lobes, and so on. Here, let's focus for a moment on what we call the temporal lobe right here. Um, and if we look really carefully, you can see there's a spot there and a little whiter than this but not quite as white as that the bone here and so on that is a spread towards the temporal lobes if we look now at what's called the cerebellar lobes right in here and again we see there's another area of concern right in there now it turns out that um, FDG PET is not generally useful for looking for cancer in brain and that's because the brain uses the most amount of glucose at 20% of the body's glucose and so if we look at a PET scan now of the brain we see all this really active tissue so I mean how would I know whether this for example is a normal structure or a cancer they could actually look very similar so we call that looking for a hot spot in an increased background or a hot spot so it's not particularly useful under those circumstances Anyway, so she does have a, a bone scan in February 2019, or February 2019. And remember, a bone scan is, a, is another functional scan. In this case, instead of looking at sugar metabolism, we're looking at uh, calcium phosphate actively responding, in this case, to the cancer. All this is terribly abnormal. She's got metastasis throughout the skeleton, an early one here, as you can see, in the left femur, one up here in the uh, right humerus. And to go back and you look now on this December uh, CT, there's the actual of uh, cancer throughout the spine here. Um, but let's go back to that brain scan she had in January. This is now what we call the bone window. The brain doesn't look very clear here, but this is what we call the bone window. Let's look at the radiologist's report. 
quotes, no suspicious or destructive bony changes. And yet very clearly there are gross abnormalities. This didn't happen between uh, January and February. In fact, it's right there, but missed on the radiologist reading of that scan. Um, now let's go back to August 2018. Part of an investigation as well as of her pelvis here. This is her sacrum, lower lumbar spine. But we know she's got active disease in the lumbar spine. And it would, this has been around for a really long time. But in fact, if you look carefully, guess what? There's the uh, active cancer in the bone missed again on the CT. Part of the investigation, she actually had for ongoing pain, uh, pelvic x-rays, plain x-rays, reported as normal, but very clearly she has widespread uh, cancer throughout the, uh, the pelvis as we know. So, to summarize, between August 2018 and February 2019, this patient has had almost 20 investigations and many of the findings were missed on the anatomical tests like the CT and plain films. But just imagine what it's like for this patient. She's actually terribly uh, uncomfortable, as you might imagine, from that bone scan. Uh, she's waiting for these tests. Everybody's anxious. She goes through these stressful tests. She's waiting at the doctor's uh, appointment, you know, and they, they still can't tell her what's going on. It isn't until December they start to get a hint that she may have a really bad situation situation with the cancer. But what about if she's in Quebec, uh, the right next door? Well, this is the breast mass. They would have seen this and of course she would have had the biopsy of the le breast lesion with the brain. We've seen she would have had a CT or MR and critically she would have had an FDG PET scan. Now this was the one test she will not be allowed to have because she lives in Ontario, an FDG PET scan. So why would Dr. Sue Quebec think an FDG PET scan would be essential? and hopefully you'll understand by the end. So her family and the patient are very distraught, as you can imagine. They want you to do everything they possibly can. This is, she's trying to deal with this news, uh, but she's got stage four cancer. It is not curable. She can only be offered palliative therapy, trying to give her as much quality of life as possible for as long as possible. So she'll be started on six cycles of very toxic medications with potential for severe side effects, including death itself, because if they destroy her bone or she may die of an infection. Now, because she lives in Ontario, She'll only be allowed to have be followed up with bone scans, a CT, maybe an MR, typically after she's already gone through four cycles of therapy. Yet, bone scans are very sensitive to picking up cancer, but unfortunately they cannot determine whether the patient's responding to therapy or not because of the length of time for the bone scan to change. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is a can patient's back here, the back of their head and their pelvis here. This is a breast cancer patient. They have bone metastasis at multiple sites here. This is a bone scan four months after therapy. Well, you're right. if you thought it looked worse, you're right. It actually does look worse. There's more lesions and some of them are more active. So obviously the critical question for that patient is the therapy working or not? Do I change? What do I do? Well, that scan at four months, if I was looking at, I could say, well, it could mean it's not responding and needs a change in therapy. But I'd also have to say, well, it could mean a positive response to therapy, and no need to change therapy. And in fact, this is what we call a flare response. It looks worse because the body's actually effectively uh, starting to deal and get rid of that cancer, deal with it. And if we wait now a year and look at the bone scan, it's almost normal the patient was in fact responding to therapy. In short, it's impossible for, to tell the difference on a bone scan, change therapy or not. What we do know for sure is this 83-year-old patient simply doesn't have a year to determine whether the therapy was working or not. So why would those doctors in Quebec want an FDG PET scan and get one? Or for that matter, if they lived in Chile or Paraguay. Well, here's an FDG PET scan of a breast cancer patient. A lot of cancer in the bones here and soft tissue in the liver and so on. So that's the baseline scan. This is after three months. Clearly, this patient has had essentially a complete response to that cancer. So if you saw that as the patient, you'd say, well, gee, it's a, I'm going to stay on this therapy because obviously it's working. But what if the patient could know after only one cycle of therapy whether the treatment had a chance of helping? So let's look at an example. This is a lung cancer patient. This is a baseline scan, and this is with a, one of these new therapies called erlotinumab. Who can pronounce these things, eh? Anyway, this is the lesion here, and it's very active on the FDG PET scans, the baseline. Now remember, this is a scan taken just after one treatment 10 days later right? You can, and the patient can see this. Look, there's a lot less sugar being used here. This is a clear indication that therapy is likely to be very effective. We also can see that little not so active one there, uh, but look here, it's essentially gone. Now, the patient looks at that. They could see the drugs working and decide to continue, put up with the side effects and so on. 
but unfortunately, especially with widespread, and this patient's had his cancer for a very long time. Um, here's the baseline scan as an example. This isn't the patient herself, but we, we measure that sugar with a quantitative index we call SUB max. It's three and a half times background. The follow-up scan shows it's 5.3. It's actually worse. This is doomed to fail. Now, this patient would then look at that, make an informed choice to stop the drug and focus her remaining time in life on the quality of life with her family and friends. And FDG PET is the only way of determining the response at an early stage. Yet, according to Cancer Care Ontario and McMaster experts, there is no quotes quality of evidence end of quotes for the routine use of PET CT for breast cancer patients. So, the consequences of living in Ontario's patient's first evidence-based healthcare system for this 83-year-old patient, for this very sick and highly stressed patient, because she lives in Ontario, she will have to have at least four cycles of highly toxic drugs before she will get the bone scan and CT. We've seen the limitations, and in reality, almost certainly what will happen is they will not be able to tell whether it's working or not, and so she will go through all six cycles and die with the least amount of quality of time with her family and friends and going through every possible side effect that she possibly could have. It doesn't have to be this way. Introduced properly PET could provide far better humane and truly patient focused care. If OHIP only paid for imaging tests that had the best chance of advancing the patient's management, healthcare in Ontario would not be just le not just less harmful to the patients, it actually would be cheaper to the taxpayer. So let's go back and look at Quebec. They have only half our population, the same number of PET cameras, and they scan on an average of 3,000 patients per camera per year with proper indications, and they actually use methods of science and peer-reviewed literature. What about Ontario? Ontario has the least number of PET scans per thousand populations of anywhere in the world where PET is available. And we're only scanning 800 patients per camera per year. Remember Quebec? 3,000 patients per camera per year. But the bad news for Ontario patients it gets even worse. Up to 90% of OHIP indications are the exact opposite of the world expert body of opinion, and our 83-year-old patient is a classic example of why. Now, just as a point of interest, look at the country of Turkey. So based on the same lack of quality evidence, Turkey has just under a PET 100 PET scanners. If we do not start demanding answers from these people and their various cohorts and, and people who are doing what they can for PET in Ontario and so-called a quality health care system. And of course, Cancer Care Ontario McMaster Health Sciences who they would determine the actual quality of evidence for PET. The fate of this 83-year-old woman and countless other words, others will be sealed. After more than 15 years of efforts, my colleagues and I have been unable to bring this 83-year-old woman with breast cancer any closer to the position that doctors in truly third world countries would know was the best for this particular patient and their patients. And their politicians wouldn't be directing their medical experts to do whatever was necessary to discredit, delay, and block their patients from an accepted world standard of medical care. That distinction belongs solely to Ontario's politicians. It deeply troubles and saddens me that so far we have been powerless to help this woman and countless other patients with cancer, concerns about dementia, and other serious illnesses where PET has been the long accepted standard of care. But that's the reality of living in Ontario. Here's my website, my social media sites. Maybe if you learn more information, maybe we can end uh, this reign against our patients. Thanks for watching.